I want to welcome you to Calvary, and I appreciate you joining us for worship together. As we worship online in a special time of year, this Christmas season, I, I'm thankful that you've taken some time to join us. I am Pastor David, and as you join us in worship this morning, I want to make sure you're aware of our online worship page, depending upon how you got to um, our worship for this time. But on our website, cbcmodesto.org slash online, you can find links to several of the things I'm going to mention here in just a minute that will provide you some more information and hopefully allow us to get to know each other better. One of the things you're going to find on that online page is a link to our digital connect card. Now, if you want to go right to it, you can type our website slash connect. And it's just a very brief form where we're asking for just a little bit of information. We want to get to know you better, connect with you. And connection is something that is definitely so necessary in general, but also in 2020. So we appreciate you giving us a little bit of information. We're promised we're not going to use that to be invasive or to harass you in any way. We just want to begin to build a relationship and connect with you. One of the things you're also going to find on that page is a link to our giving. And that is an important aspect of what we do. And I know sometimes people may think, well, again, a church asking for money. But see, the way we look at it is we want to be a blessing to our community. The Bible talks about how we share Jesus in our Jerusalem, which is our city, and then to the ends of the earth. And so that's where we begin. And one of the things we're working on, and part of where money that's being given right now is going to go to, is helping those who are struggling with food this time of year. And we want to make sure we do that. Now, typically we do what we call our Christmas baskets. And that's where we put the baskets together and then give them to families. And we're still connecting with families, but we're going to do it a little bit differently this year. We're going to work directly with a, a local grocery store. And what we're going to do is provide an opportunity for families to get the things they need. And see, sometimes as we put these baskets together, we don't necessarily know the allergies. We don't know the issues. We don't know the access to cooking utensils and what a family may have. And so we want to support people exactly where they are. And so we're going to work with this grocer. So if you are able and want to help support that, you could just mark either on your online gift or if you do a check, just put Christmas baskets and it'll still go to the same thing. But we're going to work directly with these families to help them get what they need at Christmas time. And so we just want to continue to be a blessing. And that's just one of the ways that we use the financial resources here at Calvary that are given. But if you want to be a part of that, I say thank you. Thank you for joining us in that because we want to be a blessing. And we also want to bless those who are going to the ends of the earth. At this time of year, we do what's called our Lottie Moon Christmas offering in honor of Lottie Moon, who was a missionary to China. And so if you want to give to that, helping those who are going across the nation, as we are here in our Jerusalem, they've gone to the ends of the earth. And who knows, that may be what God calls you to. But whether he does or not, we can support and we can help. And so if that's something you'd like to give to, again, just put that in the memo of whatever form of your gift and just write Lottie Moon, and that's where that money is going to go. We don't take any portion of that. That goes directly on to um, a global organization that we work with and partner with known as the International Mission Board. And so we thank you for considering these, and I ask you to pray about these things. We don't take them lightly, and I don't want you to either. But it is a blessing to see the good news in the name of Jesus go everywhere. And so that's what we're here for. But as you're praying about that, we understand there may be a lot of things on your heart and mind that you're praying about, things that are going on in your life. And we want to support you and help you in that. And we would love to have the opportunity to pray for you, but also to pray with you. And so if you have anything, again, on our online page, there's a link to this. But if you want to go directly to this prayer form, just type in our address and then put slash prayer. And it'll take you right there. And we just want to support you and join you in whatever God is up to in your life. We understand there's a lot of challenges, a lot of hard things going on. And so, again, I want to thank you for being here, joining us at Calvary this morning for our worship online. But as we begin our worship, that's where we want to start is with prayer. And so let's go before the Lord and talk to Him and ask Him to join us as we prepare to sing and lift up the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are good and faithful, and I thank you for joining us in this time of worship. And so I just ask that, Holy Spirit, you would move, 
you will just remind us of how real, how strong, how good you are. And so please be with us in this place. We just ask that you would get glory in the place where we are, in our homes, in our cars, wherever we may be, that you are there. And we thank you. So we just ask that as we head into worship, when we worship in song, we worship in the word, that it would just be filled with your presence and your spirit. We thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This next song we're going to be singing is called Truth Be Told, and we've done this once before, but I think it's a good song, especially as we're moving into Christmas, and today we're talking about peace. That, unfortunately, too many times we buy the lies of where that's going to come from. And I think this song really reminds us where the truth lies. And so I pray that you really listen to the words and join in singing with us. Our Heavenly Father, God, we just, we thank you that we have such a, a wonderful opportunity to worship you. Lord, just thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, Lord, and that we can know you. Lord, and thank you for the love that you've shown us. And Lord, we thank you for all the things that you've given us and, and the things that we just get to enjoy, the, the gifts of your grace. And Lord, with those, we want to take this time now to, to give some of that back. Lord, and we want to do that uh, because it, it's a, a way that we can recognize that all things come from you and a way that we can worship you by giving back. 
Lord, we just thank you for the season and for the ways that you're going to use these tithes and offerings. Um, we, we know that you, you have plans and, and what you're going to do. Lord, we just pray that um, we, can, we can know the ways that we can, can bless people with, with these funds. And Lord, we just pray um, that you'll bless the giving of these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. For our passage today, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, and you can either turn there or swipe there and, and open to Isaiah chapter 40. And as you're doing that, I just want to remind you that we do have some notes that are on our online page on our website. And so if you go to cbcmodesto.org slash online, you can find those notes there. But I just want to thank you for getting into God's Word with me during this time. But Isaiah 40 is where we are going to be. Now, one of the things that is enjoyable for my wife and I when we've got some downtime is we like to spend some time watching HGTV. HGTV. And we've just gotten to where we really enjoy, especially the kind of the, the renovation, the fixer-upper type shows. And one of the shows that we like is the show called Hometown. Hometown. It's this couple, and they're, they live in Laurel, Mississippi. And so you kind of understand the show. It's pretty formulaic as far as that goes. But they've got somebody who's moving, wants to buy a house. They hire the service of this couple, and then they go in and do some renovation. And we were recently watching one show, and this couple had picked a home, that really looked like on the outside had good structure, some good things to work with. And so as they began the renovation, one of the things they discovered is what was on the outside didn't necessarily match what was on the inside and really what was underneath. Because as they began to open things up and as they began to look at the foundation, they found some major issues. There were joists that were rotting and just things that had sagged over time and it was just not a good situation. And they weren't sure how far they were going to have to go. 
Were they going to have to tear up all the floors on the inside and almost kind of build up from there? What was this going to take? Obviously, the financial impact of this was looming over them, and it looked like it was going to be pretty big. But they knew there was no moving forward. Because if they didn't deal with this foundation, if they didn't address this issue, anything they built on top wasn't going to last. It didn't matter how good it looked. It wouldn't last at all. And you see, one of the things I think that is very familiar to us in life, like that house, a lot of us act and move and portray that we on the outside are fine. We've got things going good and well. But we know that the reality is anything but that. You see, when you start to get under the surface and really begin to see, that's not the case. And see, one of the things that happens is in all of that struggle and wrestle, one of the things we're lacking and very much wanting is peace. We want that sense of peace, that sense of calm within us so that the inside matches the outside. And see, that's the beautiful thing about Christmas because at this time, as the baby Jesus is coming, the baby Jesus is about to be born at Christmas. See, what also is coming is peace. And this peace that is coming is a peace that lasts. And so let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 40 and let's see what this peace is really all about. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, we're going to begin in verse 1. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. And I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in the field. Their grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the time and the opportunity to come together. And Lord, we realize distance may separate us. We may be even participating at different times throughout this week. But Father, we thank you that we still come around the Word of God. We come around the Bible. And Lord, as I read in that passage, the grass withers and the flower fades but the Word of God remains forever. And so, Father, we just ask that you would take this Word that lasts and speak to us. Holy Spirit, that you would help us to have ears to hear and hearts that are open to whatever you want to say to us in this time. And I just ask that you would guide me and give me the words to communicate. And I pray that as you speak through me, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And may it all be to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we begin to dig into Isaiah chapter 40, I want to give you a little bit of background. I want to back up a little bit. and I want to explain a little bit of where we are and what's going on in this book. 
Because honestly, this is an interesting book, and you might be thinking, if you know much about this book, this may not seem like a Christmas book, because one of the aspects of this book is there's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of judgment going on in this book. And part of the reason for that judgment is because Israel has been following other gods. When Israel entered into a covenant with God, given to them through Moses on Mount Sinai, and continually shared with them multiple times, the statement was, I will be your God, you will be my people. And the warning that as they went into Canaan, into the promised land, don't follow after the other gods. Don't let them pull you away from me. Because everything else is a substitute. Everything else is a cheap alternative. But see, like a lot of us, Israel didn't listen. And so the prophet Isaiah is coming to give God's judgment. Coming to tell, this is what's coming. This is what's going to happen. But what's interesting about this book is even as that is there, this aspect of judgment, it's also a book of hope. It's a book of hope because through the prophet Isaiah, also God declares, I've got a plan. I'm going to do some things. I'm going to bring you back to me. And yes, there will be a time where you're going to have to go through the consequences and the suffering that you brought on yourself because you didn't obey what I said. But see, God doesn't stop there in this book. He doesn't just give hope to Israel. We find prophecies throughout the whole book that give hope to the whole world. Where God was saying, this is coming. Emmanuel is coming. One is coming who is going to give hope to the whole world. And so this book can really be broken up into two parts. And chapters 1 through 39 is really a lot of this. Here's what's coming. Here's the consequences of what's happened. The fall of Jerusalem is coming. You're going to be going into exile. Two nations, Assyria, Babylon, are going to be a part of this. But see, even at the beginning when God called Isaiah, he told Isaiah, they're not going to listen to you. I know my people. They're a stiff-necked people, a stubborn people. They're not going to listen. But all that was foretold in that book came to be. And so in the first half of the book, there are these two topics going back and forth, judgment and hope. And I have no doubt that in this time, as we finish chapter 39, exile has come. Jerusalem has fallen. And I have no doubt in that moment, they were wishing for peace. They were wanting peace. There was no peace to be had at that time. And I think in a lot of ways, what they were really after is kind of our English definition of peace. Because in the English, when we talk about peace, we're really talking about the absence of war or conflict. That's what most of us want in our lives. We want some peace, that we get along with people, that there's no problems going on. But see, all of that misses the biblical idea of peace. Because in the Hebrew, there's a word that many of you might be familiar with or have heard somewhere. And that word is shalom. Shalom. And the idea of shalom is that things are whole. Things are complete. There's a wholeness. There's a well-being. And so that means a lot more than just the absence of conflict. Because really, I think it gets to the heart of why we want peace. We want peace because things aren't whole. We want things, we want peace because we know something's not right, something's missing. And this word for peace, shalom, is used over 250 times in the Old Testament. And so I have no doubt this is the kind of peace that the Israelites were wanting in this time. But I think this is also the peace we want. And they especially wanted that because as we transition into chapter 40 of Isaiah, which is the second half of this book, chapter 40 through 66, there's a shift here. Because now the exile is over. The exile is over. And what's interesting in this book is this book is given the name of the prophet Isaiah. 
But most likely there were other people involved in the writing of this book. Most likely his disciples who recorded and took things he had written, prophecies he had given, because the exile ended over 100 years after Isaiah died. So we know Isaiah couldn't have been on the scene at this moment. But it still doesn't change as we read this book. It is inspired by God. As God moved through to give this to us. And so in this shift in chapter 40, now the exile is over. And I have no doubt that with the exile over, it'd be easy for the Israelites to think, hey, peace is coming now. Woo, we're good. Peace is coming. And see, I think that's a lot of what we might think as well. But we've got to remember this first thing, and that is the fact that peace, peace is not found in circumstances. Peace is not found in circumstances. And I think anybody, you, you live long enough, you know this to be true. Life is just full of ups and downs. And hey, let's look at 2020. I mean, let's be honest. 2020, hey, if you were looking for circumstances that were going to bring you peace, 2020 is not it. But see, that's why we've got to remember that peace is not found in circumstances. And see, I love in chapter 40, that, that's why it's so important where the writer begins in verse 1. See, in verse 1, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. See, in this first couple of verses, there's some interesting things I want you to notice. Some interesting things. The very beginning, especially in verse 1, you see the words, my. Comfort, comfort, my people. And it says, says, your God. These words, my and your, these are, are very personal. There's a connection here. And then in verse 2, it says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Speak tenderly. See, the fact is, all this is very relational. And it's relational, which makes sense because of who God is. God is trying to help us understand peace is not going to be found in the circumstances. You go all the way back to the garden, back to the Garden of Eden, where God first created mankind, Adam and Eve. From the garden all the way to today, what you find is God is relational. God's whole intent is for relationship. But see, in that relationship, the beauty of a relationship is the ability to choose. And God gave that to Adam and Eve. And so in the garden with God, he also gave them the opportunity to choose. But as Satan enters the scene, he, scene, he tempts them. And so instead of being in relation with God, the temptation is you get to choose. And guess what? You can be your own God. And see, unfortunately, that's exactly what Adam and Eve chose. And see, that's the same choice we continue to make. That we want to be the God of our life. We want to be the one who says where we go and what we do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Uh Uh-uh. That's not how this goes. That's not how we roll. That's what we think. But See, unfortunately, there's a foolishness that is there. And this is sin. That we think we can be God. And through time and time and generation and generation of humanity, we see this foolishness played out. But see, as God watched and God moved and tried to intervene, he knew that he would need to do something permanent. And so what does God do? God, in the form of Jesus, leaves heaven and earth to be the baby in the manger at Christmas. And from that manger lives and grows and eventually goes to the cross to be the perfect one who would pay for your sin and for mine. 
And because of God's desire to be relational, he moves heaven and earth to pay for our sins. You see, otherwise we would have to pay for them. And that's part of the consequences. That's part of what Israel has gone through, the judgment. And see, you and I, when we choose our way, when we choose sin, we choose to sin, we choose to suffer. We pay the consequences. But see, ultimately, Jesus dies on the cross, so we don't have to spend an eternity separated from God. We need to spend an eternity with God in relationship. That isn't just about eternity. It's about today as well. But see, we see this foolishness, this folly played out because what do we do? We keep looking for peace in our our circumstances. We keep trying to generate it instead of seeing the good news that God has given See, the good news at that moment in Isaiah 40 is not just that they're out of exile, not that they're returning back to Israel. It's so much more than that. And that's what's going on in verses 3 through 5, this declaration. Shout it, declare this good news. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, have a personal relationship with him, that is good news for you to share. That is the good news of Christmas, that in Christmas there is something coming that not only is exciting on December 25th, it will change the rest of your life. And see, what is written in verses 3 through 5 is a direct relationship, a direct statement of the one who was to come, who would be the one before Jesus. And that one is John the Baptist. If you look at Matthew 3, you'll see some of these same words as, We're seeing in Isaiah 40. And so God is declaring, God is saying, there is peace to be found, but it's not going to be in your circumstance. See, I think a lot of us hear this and we go, hey, I'm good with that. I, I want peace. I mean, who doesn't? But see, I think the struggle begins when We keep our eye on our circumstances. Because you might say, you don't know my situation. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. See, Christmas is anything but a time I look forward to. Because see, when my family gets together, oh, it's anything but peace. See, the truth is, when my family gets together, it's all out war. And that may be your situation. And you may be looking at Christmas and dreading it. You could be on the other side where you're looking at Christmas and hoping it's going to bring things that never will. Because the presents aren't going to satisfy. This food isn't going to satisfy. Because the circumstances were never intended to bring peace. And I think sometimes the way we try to create peace in our lives was very evident in the movie Kung Fu Panda. In the animated film Kung Fu Panda 2, the main character Po has has grown in his use of Kung Fu. But the next thing his master wants to teach him is inner peace. And there's a scene in the movie where he's just beating his head against a post saying, inner peace, inner peace, inner peace, hoping he can force himself. See, I think that's what a lot of us are trying to do. If I can generate the right circumstances, if I can get things going on, people are happy, everything's going good, I'm going to be able to create this peace that I'm hoping for. You see, true peace, peace on the inside, is not something you can manufacture. I see, true peace is not found in the circumstances. It's found in the one who knows your circumstances. Because Jesus not only knows your circumstances, he is outside of them. And while the world and everything around you can be going crazy, what Jesus can do is bringing calm. He can bring his peace. But see, in order for that to happen, we've got to start in the right place. We've got to start in the right place because peace is built 
on hope. Peace is built on hope. You see, the whole idea of being at peace, the idea that things are whole, things are complete, is built on hope. Because last week as we looked at, biblical hope is a confident expectation. It's not a feeling. And that's so much, I think, why we struggle and wrestle for peace and wanting it. It's because we're paying so much attention to our feelings. Instead of realizing that peace and hope are not based upon our feelings, they are based upon the person of Jesus. But to really have any peace, you've got to have hope. Because without hope, you are without certainty. You are really holding on to a wish. And so in those moments, you may have the absence of conflict. And you may be able to generate that for a time. But see, peace is going to remain elusive. Because you're still going to be in situations. You're still going to go through those ups and downs of life. And that's why hope is necessary. That's why peace is built on hope. Because hope is coming. That's what we talked about last week. Hope is coming. And how is hope coming? Hope is coming in Jesus. And that's why I love what the writer was saying in verse 9. This is a declaration. Oh, Zion, messenger of good news. Shout from the mountaintop. Shout at lateral Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. Jesus is coming. And see, when we realize that Jesus is coming, when we realize that the baby in the manger is so much bigger than just that moment, but that moment was the beginning of changing everything. Because see, what happens is when I realize my hope is based on a person who is outside of time and outside of circumstances, that person being Jesus, I realize there is someone who is in control of things, can see things I don't even see. And what that means is I can be at peace. I can be at peace because I don't have to worry. I can be at peace because when I come to know Jesus, what Jesus does is Jesus gives his rightness, his righteousness, his goodness to me. And now the father looks at me as whole and complete. He looks at me as one as no longer deserving judgment, no longer deserving the penalty for my own sin because Jesus is taking care of it. And so no matter how hard things may be in a moment, I can be at peace because I know who's with me in that moment. I know who has everything under control. And see, I love the idea that Jesus doesn't come to calm the storm. He comes to calm the sailor in the storm. But see, when you have no hope, peace will always remain elusive. And see, that peace is built on hope because Jesus is coming. And this is exactly what Isaiah has been talking about. In Isaiah 9, he talked about, he said, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. See, this is Isaiah. Back in the 
the 7th and 8th century, writing about the one who would come hundreds of years before it ever happened. Writing about this. That Jesus is coming. And see, that's where we need to be looking to. Because often, what do we do? We look to government. Government, you got to take care of this. We look to culture. We look to technology, medicine, every other thing that we can think of that we hope is going to bring us peace. And see, all we find in all of those areas are broken people who can't do it. Because, see, we're not whole, we're not complete. And only do we become whole and complete when we come to a personal relationship with Jesus. And notice as we read in Isaiah 9, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is peace for us. And see, you can continue to try and find peace in your circumstances. And you can try to manufacture it. But if you've got no hope, you will not find peace. If there's anyone who doubts or thinks, nah, this can't be for me, there's no way. I mean, if you knew my background, my story, everything about me, this isn't for me because I've just I'm blown it, I'm too far gone. Or anybody who thinks, you know what, I'm pretty good. See, Isaiah was very clear in chapter 40, verse 5. Who was all this for? For all people will see it together. All people. So it doesn't matter how good you think you are or how bad you think you are. There is no peace without Jesus. There is no lasting peace. There is no true peace. And see, while this message may sound good and you may be thinking, I want this. But how, how can I trust this? How, how, can I, how can I know that this is for me? But see, again and again, if we, as we have read in chapter 40, as we read in chapter 9, God says, I'm going to do something. And always what God says, God does. And what we see is prophecy fulfilled. Emmanuel, God with us. Not only is hope coming, peace is coming. And we find that in the baby. And so you, you may be at a point, and I, I don't think there's any doubt that we all want peace in our lives. But you may be feeling like, what, where do I start with this? And I think you might end up feeling a little bit like Lucy felt in one of the Peanuts comic strips. Because in one of them, Lucy's talking to Charlie Brown, and she says to Charlie Brown, oh, man, I hate everything. I hate people. I hate the world. And Charlie Brown looks at Lucy and says, I thought you had inner peace. And Lucy responds, I have inner peace. The problem is my outer obnoxiousness. And see, I think we may feel the same way. Everything around me is going nuts. But see, without Jesus, there is no inner peace. No matter how hard you try to manufacture it, no matter how hard you try to put it all together, you're not going to find it. And see, the greatest gift that you might need this Christmas is a gift that Jesus gives. You see, Jesus talked about it in John 14. He said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. 
See, no matter how hard you're trying to find this gift, Jesus said it very plainly. The world's not going to find it. And so I pray today that you stop looking at circumstances, looking at situations and trying to manufacture peace on your own. Because not only is peace coming, peace has come. And it's in the form of Jesus. And I pray that you'll experience this peace today. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you give a peace, Lord, that as your word in Philippians talks about, is a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. How can we find a peace when the world is just going crazy around us? Because, Lord, you are outside of all that. That's how we find it in you. You are bigger than our circumstances. You are bigger than the mess we're going through. And Father, I pray for anyone listening. Lord, whatever right now is keeping them awake at night, that they're wrestling with the things that are weighing heavy on them. Lord, that they would do what your word says in your word. You said, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. That rest, that peace. Jesus, it's found in you. And I pray that if there's one who maybe today has realized it, today would be the day where they would say, Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I've been trying to manufacture this peace on my own. I got no hope in anything going on around me. I need a hope that is certain. Jesus, I need you. Lord, that they would just ask you to forgive them. And because of what you did on the cross, because of your love, Jesus, you forgive. And they would put their faith in you and say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. Time and time again, you show you've got the power over everything, even death. You've got power to handle our circumstances. So we can be at peace and without worry. So if that's anyone's decision today, I pray that they would make that. And Lord, for anyone who's walked with you, knows you, has that relationship, but maybe they've been picking up things, they've been carrying them, they've been holding on to them. Today would be the day they say, I've been spending more time looking at this situation than I've been looking at you, Jesus. And Jesus, you are where I'm going to find peace. And so I pray that you help them to just lay it down. And they would say, I surrender this. I thank you that hope has come, peace has come, and Jesus, it's in you. Be with us. And we walk in that peace, live in that peace, experience that peace each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, I don't know your situation, and I don't know what the Lord might be saying to you today. But as I was praying and asking, I hope that you will respond in whatever way God might be leading you to. And if you've made any decision today, we want to encourage you. We want to support you. We want to help you. And so if you will just let us know, you can visit our website, cbcmodesto.org slash decision and share that with us. We want to encourage you. We want to support you so that as you walk with Jesus, you experience the peace that only comes from him. And whatever's going on, there may be things you're wrestling with and you're trying to figure out, how do I respond? How do I deal with them? And if maybe we can just pray for you, please share that with us. Again, we've got a form online. We want to support and encourage. We need each other. And so please share that with us so we can pray for you. Whatever God is up to, the one thing I know for sure, whatever he's doing in your life, is he wants you to know he's there. He wants you to know that he brings a hope and a peace that the world can't give you, that doesn't even compare. And so I pray this week as we finish our time together that you would experience that peace, that God would bless you. And may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you.
this week. God bless you. Have a great week.